Hello everybody, today we are going to talk about how to play Orb. Now this game is a 3-5 to five player social deduction game and logic matrix game, so make sure you have 3-5 to five players. When you open the box, you are going to have um, the contents which contain uh, this deck of cards, a rule book, and this logic matrix. So set those to the side for now, and what you'll do um, is first set up the game. So what you're gonna do is take these client request cards, shuffle them up, deal one to every player. So let's say we are doing a three player game. This is player one, this is player two, this is player three. So what is this card? Well, this is your wealthy client's request. So in this game, you are a space merchant and you collect goods and basically deliver them to your wealthy client. And your wealthy client has some peculiar interests. Um, this wealthy client wants two uh, yukatas, two beetles, and one device. So every client has different needs. Another card might have slightly different um, uh, cards or uh, items that they want. So this client wants two flowers, two devices, and uh, one yukata. So these change based off of which card you have. Your wealthy client will want different items. And this is how you win the game. Your wealthy client has sent you to this market um, to or to buy these items. And once you buy all of them and have all of them and deliver them to your client, you win the game. So we have dealt one request to every player. That is their win condition. You can set aside the rest of the requests. They will not be used in the game. Next, you'll want to find the cards with these backs, and they correspond to the symbol and item cards. So uh, in the front of them, um, you can see that uh, each card corresponds to one of the items that, one of the five items that the wealthy clients might be looking for. And there are actually six symbol cards, each corresponding to a um, alien word. So for example, fourth is one of the alien words in the alien language. So you're going to shuffle both of these up and deal one to every player um, of each. So you're going to give uh, each player one of these cards, and then you're going to give each player one of the other cards. And they are going to take these cards and keep them secret. You should not ever take um, reveal these three cards to other players um, unless uh, otherwise told so in the rules. These cards link up like this, so um, they match so that the equal sign makes a complete equal sign. And then when you flip the cards, they also have an equal sign there. And so what this represents is the fact that these two are paired. When you are dealt these two cards, they're paired for the entire game. So the Snorp is always going to be the beetle, no matter what. The Snorp is always the beetle. And so player... Um, players will each have basically a piece of secret information. They are going to know the translation of one of the alien words in the language. So that is the premise here is that, yes, you're being sent to this market to buy all of these alien goods, but you can't just buy them because you have no idea how the, what the words each mean. So, um... If you're this player, you don't know that the flower is the norp, and maybe you need to find the flower, which is the norp. And um, uh, the um, morp here is the ikata. And again, each of these players knows this piece of secret information, but they don't know the information that the other players know. Now, to finish off the setup, you're going to take this deck of locked container cards. Now, they're locked containers because on the backs, or on the backs it kind of looks like a container, but on the fronts is actually the tag on the container. So this container contains a dorp. Now, we don't know what a dorp is yet, and none of the players know what a dorp is. So, um, but this would contain an item, potentially. The morp would contain the yukata. So you know that the morp is a yukata, and so that this locked container contains that um, yukata, but uh, some players don't know that yet, uh, and so on. So each of these represents an alien word. You're going to give this deck a quick shuffle, so shuffle it up basically, and then uh, once you're sufficiently happy with the shuffle, um, we are kind of running out of space here, but essentially you deal out um, 
cards equal to the table listed in the rule book. So in the rule book, you're gonna see a table and for a three player game, um, as you can see, there are three players here. You're gonna deal the player going first four cards, the player going second four cards and the player going third five cards. So let's say this player is going first, this player is going second and this player is going third. We're gonna give the first player four cards, the second player four cards and the third player five cards. Now, when you give players cards, give them, give it to them face up. So these should actually be face down. Um, they're only face up for demonstration purposes right now, but you will also give each player five face up locked container cards. So we'll do that right now. And actually four for uh, the first and second players and five for the rest of them. Um, let's see, we are gonna have to get a little creative with our, I'm gonna move these Okay. Yeah, well, we're, we're just gonna deal them in a pile instead of um, splaying them out. But essentially, you would want to probably have it so that uh, every player can see each other's cards in their hands. Um, so you'll probably lay it out in a way where uh, you'll have all four of your cards or all five of your cards and be laid out so that everyone can see them. Uh, we don't have enough room for that um, in this um camera but we will just represent that by a pile of cards okay so um now after you've done all this you can optionally and i would definitely recommend this uh, for your the best possible experience uh, you would take this pad of um logic matrices you'd uh, rip one off and give one to each player um, we're not going to do that in this example, but you could play with these. This just really helps you kind of organize um, and remember information. So once you figure out what a symbol is, so let's say you figure out that the snorp is the beetle, you would go here, okay, this is the snorp, and this is the beetle, you would check that box because you know that the snorp is the beetle. And since the snorp is the beetle, um, the forp cannot be the beetle. Um, there's only one item and one uh, symbol that pairs. So there are not two snorps. Snorps can't be two different things, for example. Um, so you could do an X on every other uh, space that is not the snorp beetle combination in that row and in that column. Now, um, I mentioned briefly that there are six symbols and only five items. So the sixth item is nothing. It doesn't correspond to anything. Now you've set up all the players. There's actually one last part of the setup. So uh, for every game, it's a little bit different, but for the uh, three-player game, you're gonna make two pairs out of the unused symbol and item key cards. You're gonna reveal one symbol key and one item key in the pairs and have a lone symbol key card. Okay, so that's a lot, but essentially it's really simple. You're gonna take the remaining cards and pair as many as you can. So we're gonna pair these two and then we're gonna pair, let's say we're gonna pair these two and then we have one more and we're gonna just leave it there. These are the remaining pairs. So um, this is a pair, this is a pair and this is a pair, but none of the players have these cards. So none of the players should know what they are. Then just to make it a little bit easier, um, you're gonna flip over one of the items and one of the symbols and then that way, um, you know that the forp is something, and you know that the potion is something, and you know that this item is useless and garbage, but you don't know what they correspond to. That's going to be important later, so we will go over that as we talk about the turns. So let's kind of move this here. Okay, once you've finished your setup of the game, you're going to proceed to, um, with the first player, which is this player, uh, take actions. Now... On your turn, you first, before you do anything else, you may ask a question. So that's what this player guide means. On your turn, first take one A action. The A action is investigate. So you can you first investigate, then you take any of these four actions. But your first action must be investigate. You must investigate and then take any of these four actions. Now, you can always skip an action if you want. So you could just skip the investigate and then go right into one of these four, or you could even skip your entire turn if you wanted to. That would probably be a bad idea, but you could if you wanted to. 
Okay, so what does investigate do? Because that's what we have to do first. Well, investigate is asking another player a yes, no question about one of their cards. So you could ask them about their key card, um, their item, or that you could ask them about their symbol key card. And uh, you would just say something like, hey, um, you know, whoever you're, the player is, you could say, hey, Steve, or whoever it is, um, is your item card a beetle? So let's say we're player one, and we're gonna ask player two, which is Steve, if his card is a beetle. And of course, as player one, you don't know what, uh, if that's true or not. Now, Steve will tell you, okay, yes, it is a beetle, or no, it isn't a beetle. And, um, yeah, uh, Steve could lie. Uh, player two can just say, no, it is not a beetle, but, I mean, because it's face up, and uh, for example purposes, we know that Steve has a beetle, and so he is lying. Uh, and so that is the kind of risk you take when you ask a question. Um, people might lie to you. So the second part of the investigation action is you can decide to call them out on their lie if you think they're lying. Now, this is a risky move because if you call them out and you're wrong, they were telling the truth, then you have to discard a card. So um, let's say we're player one here. We have these four cards in our hand, these four locked container cards. Let's say we, uh, Steve, um, was telling the truth. Steve says, I have a beetle. And then we call him out. Well, now we have to discard a card and now we only have three cards in hand. So that can be a way that it backfires. If Steve was lying, however, then Steve is the one who discards a card. Okay, so that is the investigate action. There are a couple more um, small points about the investigate action. So first of all, in order to adjudicate a um, calling out, uh, the card must be flipped face up for everyone to see. So if player one tells Steve, hey, is it a beetle? And then Steve says, yes or no, it doesn't matter. Um, the person calling out will say, I don't, I think you're lying. Um, Steve will flip it, even if he's telling the truth, face up for everyone to see. So now player three knows that Steve has a beetle. And so that always happens when you're calling out. Uh, now, let's say that Steve had to flip up his card, but he was telling the truth. He actually gets a benefit. So this is a very specific scenario when you're telling the truth and you get called out. This is the one time where you get this bonus. So um, if honest, the, um, the answerer looks at one key card not in play or takes a free B. Now what that means is you either collect a container action, which we'll get to in a moment, or you look at one of those cards that we set aside at the beginning of the game. So if you remember, we paired these two cards in the beginning and we had one lone pair. Steve, if he told the truth and was called out on it, could look at this card, this card, or this card secretly. He gets that information, nobody else gets that information at that time. So that is one of the ways you can find out what these cards set, out, um, uh, set up in the beginning of the game are. That's one of the ways you can do that. Okay. So that is the investigate action. It is um, probably the toughest action. Uh, the other ones are really simple. So moving on, the other action you can do, and this is after you investigate, then you can take a second action out of these four. You can collect a container. And that's just drawing a card from the top of the deck. So all these cards that were not dealt out, um, there's still going to be some remaining. Uh, you would just draw a card. So um, let's say we're player one. We could just draw a card as our second action. Now, the only thing to really keep in mind about this action is if you have more than five cards, you're going to have to discard down to five cards. So if, let's say, we took another draw action, well, now we have six cards, so we're going to have to discard a card, and, and there will be a discard pile somewhere. So that is B, collecting a container. C is called a forced trade. So if, as player one, we decided to do a trade, what we would do is we would um, choose another player, take one of their cards, and give them back anything we want. So that could be an action. And the other player has no say in it. You just get to swap with them and they can't do anything about it. Of course, when it gets to their turn, maybe they'll swap back with you. So that is something you may want to think about if you're going to anger somebody um, by doing that. Now, the final action only applies in a three to four player game. We are a three player game, so this does apply. It's called the uncover action. You can discard two cards from your hand to look at one key card not in play. So this is very expensive. Discarding cards gets you farther from winning the game. 
but it gives you a lot of information. So if you decided to just take two cards from your hand and discard them, you could look at um, one of the paired things at the beginning of the game. This was paired at the beginning of the game. Um, as player one, let's say we discard two cards to take this action. Well, we could look at this, and now we would know that the forp is the device. Um, that is a secret, though, so other people wouldn't know that. And so now we have some information that other people don't know. Okay, that covers all of the actions. Now let's cover how you actually win the game. So, like I was saying at the beginning, every player had a request dealt to them at the beginning of the game. So this player, too, wanted two curing potions, two yukatas, and one sublime flower. Over the course of the game, you're going to figure out what all the items are. So, you know, as player two, you might know that this form is the beetle. Um, which you don't need. You don't need the beetle. Uh, maybe you'll ask player one some questions and you'll figure out that the Norp is the flower. And maybe um, you want the Yukata. So you n now need the Morp. So you need two Yukatas, which is, means you need two Norp Morps. You need uh, two potions, which uh, we don't know what the potion is. And you need one flower, which would mean one Norp. That means that in order to win the game, in your hand, you must have... Um, let's say two morps because the morps are the yukata so these would be two yukatas you would need two um well one flower so you would need one norp and uh what is the potion i think okay it is this pair let's say you figured out that the potion is the glorp so then you would need these two so this would need to be in your hand. And it, um, since you only can have five cards in your hand at once, essentially you need to be perfect. You need to have exactly two Morps, two Glorps, and one Norp to win the game. Once you have this in your hand, and if it is your turn, you can say, I've won. And then what you'll do is you will look at all the information secretly in case you need to double check and confirm, and then you will win the game. So what happens if you say, I win, and you are wrong because someone lied to you, or um, you just messed up somehow? Um, so let's say instead of the two Glorps, you had two Dorps because you made an incorrect deduction because somebody lied to you or something. So let's say you had this hand. Well, you have the two Yukatas, you have the Flower, but you don't have the two Potions. So what you're going to do is you're still going to look at all the cards secretly, and then you're going to find out that, well, some of the cards, you know, make me lose the game. And then you are going to actually be eliminated. You're going to discard all the cards in your hand, and you're going to flip all your face-down cards, and then you are silent for the rest of the game. You can't tell other people anything about the game, about the uh, what you saw, about what the card identities are. The other players, because you looked at the cards secretly, and you will look at other players' cards secretly as well, because you looked at them secretly, um, they won't know what you know, and so they will continue playing until they either uh, find a winner, someone else uh, calls a victory, or it could even be that multiple people mess up and then the last one standing wins. And that's how you play Orb the market for space merchant translators. Let's see, where's my box? Right here. So that is how to play. Now, um, it's a pretty simple game once you kind of get into things. Uh, it's a very logical game. So um, I call it a social deduction game because you have hidden information and they're asking each other questions. But really, I would say that when you're playing this game, it feels very puzzly. You're trying to think about what other people have, what they're going for, what they might um, want, and then kind of make some deductions based off of what they're going for. And so um, what questions they're asking kind of reveals maybe what they have. And then you kind of, um, you don't want to always be calling out because of the, uh, the fact that you have a penalty associated with it. Um, so sometimes you might trust somebody and then they are lying to you. And so that can happen as well. So there's a little bit of this bluffing element to the game. So it's got all of that mixed together. I would say though, um, it feels very puzzly compared to other social production games. If you're talking about like werewolf or mafia or a coup, um, this is much more of kind of figuring out a mini puzzle. Um, in fact, uh, let me see where, yeah, so 
You may even be familiar with the famous Einstein puzzle or the zebra puzzles. They look very much like this. You're filling out this matrix grid. And so um, uh, it's, yeah, um, it's very much in that style of um, that kind of puzzle. So if you enjoy those puzzles, I think you'll really enjoy this game. And so you should definitely consider checking it out. Um, I will leave a link um, in the comments and also in the description of a link you can go to actually go and buy this game. So I am selling these on my website for $15 or $14.99. And then when you go to checkout, it will add a shipping cost based off of um, if you're international or if you're in the U.S. Um, so normally if you're in the U.S., it's going to be uh, $4.99 for shipping, which will bring the total to a little bit, like basically $20. And then, um, and then, yeah, I will ship you the game if you order it. So I would really appreciate that. And if you want to go there right now, it is jzgames.com. So um, that is kind of the company name, jzgames.com. Then you can go and get to the storefront, and you can actually go and buy this game. So um i will again leave a link to that in the description and the comments so be sure to check that out if you think you might be interested in this game anyway thank you so much for watching this video i hope you enjoy this game um, if you have any questions feel free to leave a comment uh in this video and that's all i have for you today so thanks again for watching and see you next time